Okay, we're going to get started in a few minutes. So I'm just waiting for people to come in. Um, so we'll get started in about 10 minutes. I mean, five minutes. Can someone who is online in the chat room indicate if you can see the slides? Okay, cool. Great, thank you. Um, we'll be using that room if you have questions. Um, actually, to that question, while we're waiting for the next minute or two, I'm trying to think, if I do, let's see, if I do this, can you see that okay? Okay, got it. I do plan on writing on the slides, so we'll see what ends up happening here. Okay, <clears throat> all right, well, why don't we get started? It's just about eight o'clock, um, so hopefully people are logging in, figuring out the system. 
I think we're all going to have to get used to this uh, over the next couple of weeks. So if there's issues or anything like that, please let me know. There's a little chat room. Um, if you have questions as we're covering material or anything like that, you can also use that to ask questions, not just questions about the, the Zoom software or whatever. Um, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint screen. Um, and so um, uh, if you have any issues with that, do let me know. Okay, so let's figure out where we left off on Monday. So on Monday, we, um, uh, we had been talking about peer-to-peer -peer networking. We introduced this concept of consistent hashing. Um, and the purpose of that uh, consistent hashing idea, if you remember, was to try to allow us to very quickly find content in a peer-to-peer -peer network without having to flood that content everywhere. So this is a, a picture, for example, that is, is showing you um, uh, sort of this, this um, example where things don't work that well, where we are flooding the request all over the place. And the issue there is that our entire network ends up being focused on flooding queries and not actually doing any real work. Okay, so the goal here is to have a structure to the way we're gonna forward these messages, the, the way we're gonna do lookups, and we're gonna be seeing that in the context of the wide area internet. That's what this cord protocol is about. But in reality, in the um, back end of servers, services, et cetera, um, this same consistent hashing idea is used to locate replicas in a cluster. So, you, so in this picture, you're seeing whatever N one through six, um, imagine that you've got six servers that you're going to be looking up uh, the content on, and now we're doing a search, we're doing a lookup, we're trying to request an image, whatever it is that we're trying to serve out to the user, we want to be able to very quickly find it, and we can use the same approach. And that's actually what underpins uh, some of the infrastructure at Amazon, for example. Okay, we talked about how we are going to export from this entire network uh, an interface that looks a lot like a hash table. And in this kind of um, uh, sort of hash table type interface, uh, we've got basically, we're gonna take a name, take the thing that we're trying to look up, the content that we're trying to find, we're gonna run a hash function on it, gives us a key, and in a key value store, we're gonna just put and get that key. Um, in our particular case though, uh, we're gonna extend that, if you remember, with this lookup operation right here. So, um, Given our key, we have a way to do a lookup inside of that cord network. And once we've done that lookup, we get the IP address of the server that's responsible for that key. And we can then directly connect to that in order to um, uh, basically do put and get on that key. So it's kind of a two-step operation where we look up where it is, then we actually go over there and, and we find that. Uh, okay. All right, so some of the details. Um, we, this is what we talked about on, on Monday. We want logarithmic number of messages. That's what we're gonna consider efficient, where n is a total number of servers. And then we're going to um, have a scalable amount of state on each node, also logarithmic. Okay, I've been talking about hash functions. In some sense, you can really use kind of any hash function you want. Um, the original cord work um, that was presented in the early 2000s um, by Jan Stoika, who's now a professor at Berkeley, and Carger, who's a professor at MIT, um, uh, was based on SHA-1. Uh, today, if we were to do like a cord project or something like that, we would probably use something like SHA-256. The point is just that in any language you're using, whether it's Java, Python, or whatever, there is usually a library of these hash functions in there that you can just um, give the content to as, a, as an argument, and it will return back you know, some pseudo-random string, et cetera. Okay, um, great. Uh, okay, so let's come back to this circular space that we were talking about earlier. So on Monday, I kind of was showing this way of visualizing the key space uh, that we are dealing with. So if we have, for example, a seven bit you know, identifier space, that means that we have um, a hash function that will map objects to a number between zero and 127. So seven bits is 128 values. So we go from zero to 127. The kind of key insight and the thing that really underpins what's going on here is that we're gonna start by applying this hash function to the servers that are gonna be holding content. So these three nodes right here, 32, 105, and 90, are the three servers in this hypothetical example. Now, what is it that we're actually hashing when we say we're hashing the server's identity to get a number on this key space? Generally speaking, we would be hashing something like its IP address or its host name or something like that. 
And so you may have, you know, such and such that you see say edu, you hash it and you get the number 32. Okay. Now that we've got our three servers hashed through this identifier space, we want to start putting data in there. Uh, and so uh, individual pieces of data, like for example, an image or a uh, video segment or something like that, we're going to hash that contents and it will map to an identifier somewhere on this ring. So for example, we may have a video file that when we hash it, it gives us key five. Now, if we would like to store it here on where key five is located, there's actually no server here. So what we're going to do is store it on what we call the successor node. So basically we're gonna kind of go around this ring until we find the first server that is there and that's the server that's responsible for key five. So if you kind of look at this picture, you'll see that we have a couple keys. We have 80, five and 20. Five and 20 are both stored here on node 32 and key 80 stored here at 90. Okay, in that little chat window, any questions about that concept thus far? Um, okay, so this is kind of showing a sequence of what are called successor pointers. So in this particular figure, we have one, two, three, four, five, six servers that have been hashed to this ring. And it's showing you basically this next pointer, which is basically each server has a pointer to the one that follows it in the ring. Now, this next pointer is the only piece of state in the system that is uh, required for correctness. In other words, you've got to have this next pointer and it's got to be correct. Once it's correct, everything else that we're going to build on top of this system is an optimization designed to make it efficient to quickly look up data. Okay, there was a question here on the, on the chat about, is there a concern about running out of the number of files? Um, so it depends on what you mean by files. Um, so, um, server identities and the contents of the objects, whatever it is we're storing, go through that hash function and they get mapped to this key space. So I think your question, and, and please correct me if I'm misunderstanding your question, is, you know, is it possible that we'll basically um, fill up this ring of identifiers? Um, uh, yeah, okay, so um, you might run into that problem, for example, if you have a hash table or something like that. Like I, I build a hash map, I start putting stuff into it, eventually I run out of memory and now I can't store anything else with my hash map. Um, using say a SHA-1 or SHA-256 hash function or something like that, we are going to be mapping values into a key space that's very large, perhaps two to the 160 or two to the 256 or something like that. Um, and so the chances that you will, uh, I mean, you, the idea that you will have more than two to the 256 objects is um, not feasible. Okay, so generally speaking, the answer is no. We are not gonna run out of keys. Now, a related question that's a very good one is, will we ever have uh, what are called hash collisions? Meaning I have two different objects, I run them through the hash function and I get the same value. That can happen, um, uh, but, uh, we're basically gonna put that problem aside because it's very rare. Um, you can work out the probability using the birthday paradox and uh, the fact that we have two to the 256 values. Um, uh, for us, we're just, we're gonna not consider that case because it's very unusual. Now, if you're a company like Dropbox perhaps or Microsoft or Google, where you have so much data, many exabytes of data, you might actually end up running into rare kind of hash collisions. Again, we're not gonna worry about that in our particular case, but good question. Okay, so at this point, we've just built basically a distributed link list. So the way to think of it is each of these servers that's running here is going to be uh, responsible for a portion of the key space. So in this case, however many objects we're gonna store in this, in this network, we would divide that by six, and that's roughly speaking how much data is gonna be stored on each of these nodes. And everyone's got a pointer to the next node, and that pointer is gonna be like an IP address. So that if you're at 120 and we need to and, and we need to sort of go to the next node, you're gonna follow an IP pointer, send an RPC call, in this case to node 10. Okay, um, so the question uh, here uh, was, do we hash the contents of the whole file, like a 10 gigabyte video file? It's actually just up to your application. Potentially, yes. So um, Cord itself is really just a lookup protocol where I give it an object and I get back a, an IP address, basically. Um, how you use that is sort of up to you. 
there is a cord based file system that um, stores objects on nodes. Um, you can sort of like in project two, break your object into smaller blocks or chunks and you can store those chunks. And now you have basically a file that contains all your metadata, which is like the file name and all the chunks. And then once you've got those chunks, you then look each of those up individually, you pull all it down, you put it back together and it's just like project three. An advantage of doing it that way is that um, if you store an entire object on one of these nodes, um, you know, if it's a 200 gigabyte file or something like that, it may use up a lot of space on that. Area. Whereas if you kind of spread it out a little bit, um, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, cool. So we talked, we ended class on Monday talking about this example use case. If, if, if I'm at node 10, so let's say I'm some client over here. Uh, because of Zoom, I can't use my little surface pad. So be patient with my mouse mousing. Okay, so if I'm a client and I contact, let's say node 10, that's the only node I happen to know about on this peer to peer network and I say, I'd like to get key 80, please. So, you know, node 10 is basically like, well, I don't have key 80 because node 10 is gonna be responsible for every uh, key between 120 and 10. And so key 80 is not there. It's gonna send it here to 32. 32 doesn't have it either, it sends it to 60. And now that sends it to node 90. And node 90 does have key 80 because uh, 80 is sort of here in the uh, in between node 60 and node 90. At that point, that request would, would terminate back to node 10, which could send that to the client. Okay, so um, this is a very simple look algorithm. If you just sort of, this is some pseudocode just describing basically what we just said. It's basically a link list implementation. Okay. Now, obviously where we left on Monday was that um, if all we did was build this thing, what we would have is a distributed link list that would have O of N runtime, which is not good. Uh, if you have a million nodes, you know, you don't want to do a million lookups. Um, and the state in this particular case is just a single next pointer or successor pointer. Now, maybe we add a predecessor pointer as we'll see a little bit later so that we can add new nodes to our system. So you have two pointers. That's O of one state. So we have too high of a runtime O of n, and we have too small of a um, uh, state O of one. So we're going to kind of split the difference here. Okay. Before we describe exactly how this is implemented on top of Cord, I want to kind of um, take a small diversion to actually give you some intuition, uh, and that intuition comes from uh, a data structure uh, that's credited to Pew in 1989. Uh, and it's called a, uh, a skip list data structure. So, um, uh, okay, so we start here with our, um, let's see if I get there. So we're going to start here with our, uh, our link list that we've just built. Uh, I'm not showing it wrapping around, I'm just kind of showing it right there, like a standard link list from uh, lower div. The idea behind a, a skip list is that imagine that. In addition to, so here we have our head pointer and our head pointer has a single next pointer pointing to each node. Okay, so that's standard link list. Imagine we have two head pointers right now. So we have the first one, we have the first one and the second one. The first one is just like as before, every node is connected to the next node. But now imagine that um, the second next pointer, number two here, uh, on average points about two away from each other. Now you'll notice that it's not exactly two apart, but it's sort of on average two apart. Um, and now imagine we add additional rows to our sort of link list. So we're extending this link list data structure so that we're adding a sequence of these pointer nodes here. And at each level, we're pointing successively further away. So in the beginning, we always send one across. On the second level, we're sending on average two, uh, then we're sending on average four, and then we're sending on average eight, et cetera. So this data structure is called a, a, a skip list data structure. And it's kind of got, a, it's got a couple nice properties to it. So first of all, um, has anyone heard of this data structure before out of curiosity? Has anyone covered it in, in algorithms or anything like that? Okay, got it, no. Okay, so, um, oh, okay, 100 covered it, wow. Okay, good, go Tritons, good for UCSD. Um, okay, so whether or not you've seen it, it's actually fine because 
I basically just explained what's going on. Now, let me just tell you a couple of the properties that this has um, and why it's important. So first of all, if we made every single level exactly a factor of two away, so the bottom is one away, so that's two to the zero power. The next level is, is uh, two away, so that's two to the first power, then two squared, then two cubed, et cetera. And if we ensured that that was always true, really what we would have built is actually a um, tree data structure. We would have embedded a tree data structure inside of what looks like a kind of linked list data structure. And so we could do logarithmic lookups. And so the way we're gonna do logarithmic lookups is basically you start here at the top level and you go as far as you can uh, without going over. So notice we're storing the, the data items in sorted order here. And so, you know, you start at the top one, you go as far as you can. If you end up going too far, like at this very top level right here, if we follow the next pointer, we've gone too far to the end. So let's say we're looking up uh, number eight. So then we drop down one list and then we go here to four, then we go to six, and then if we kept going, we'd hit nil, which is too far. So we drop down a level, then we're going to nine, that's a little bit too far. We drop down a level and now we make our way to eight. And so if these were um, exactly factors of two apart, uh, we'd have perfect logarithmic lookup time. Now the issue with that, of keeping those pointers exactly factors of two apart is that anytime we add or remove, da remove data into our list, we have to move a lot of pointers around because it's possible that we have to now fix all of the other pointers to keep this exact power of two property, uh, to keep it in place. Okay, so the kind of insight behind the skip list data structure is to make this data structure probabilistic, meaning that with high probability, you get logarithmic lookup time. And the way we solve that problem is every time we add a new element into our data structure. So for example, let's imagine that we added in 4.5. And I'm not good at drawing with a mouse, but assume that says 4.5. Again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new node just like we would in a linked list, but we are going to choose a height that is, um, we're gonna randomly choose the height. So every node is gonna have a level zero pointer to it. Half the nodes are gonna have a level two pointer. And then a quarter of the nodes are gonna have a level three pointer. Uh, a sixteenth of the nodes will have a level four pointer, et cetera. And so if we, um, so we, we compute the height, maybe we end up with a height of, of, of three in this case. So then we add this element right here in, into where it belongs. And then all we have to do is basically hook up the left and right pointers right here and we've inserted that node into the network. And so as long as we choose the height of this node based on those uh, probabilities, then on average, um, we can expect with high probability that this will have a logarithmic lookup time. Okay, questions about that. So the key reasons, the key things that I want you to take away from this discussion are that um, we're gonna follow these pointers as far as we can without going over. And uh, what we're doing in this particular case is by adding a logarithmic number of these pointers, uh, we can do a log lookup in this data structure. Okay, so how does that get mapped to this chord idea? Just like the, the, the skip list, uh, where's my mouse? Okay, there it is, oops. Okay, just like the skip list, each node in chord is gonna contain not just one successor pointer, but it's actually gonna contain log n successor pointers. So we're gonna have basically a pointer that points halfway across the key space. So one pointer will basically point to halfway across the key space. Then we're gonna have a pointer that's a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, et cetera. And so the goal is that if we're here at node 80 and we wanna look up something, oops, over here at you know node uh, whatever, 42 or something like that, key 42, we're gonna follow these pointers as far as we can without going over. Uh, and that will get us closer in the key space to where we're looking, you know, our destination. And then we'll be able to basically um, emulate kind of a log n lookup timer. Um, ah, so someone asked if uh, in this particular skip list example, if a number has a connection in layer three, then it also has one in layer two, et cetera. Yes, so every node has a layer one or zero pointer. So you start with a linked list. Okay, so that's what's required for this thing to work. Half the nodes on average have a height of two, a quarter have a height of three, a sixteenth have a height of four, 
you know, et cetera. Uh, and so if you have, let's say, a height of three, uh, you know, the, the layer three pointer is going to be there, the layer two pointer and the layer one pointer. So you don't skip, I mean, you, uh, um, you just built up, basically. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Okay, so again, so this is kind of what we're doing in this particular case. So if we're here at node 80 and we want to look up, say, node, I don't know, 120, something like that. If we were to go kind of across the key space, we end up going past 120, uh, which is too far. Uh, and so we're going to kind of go back a pointer level to a quarter of the key space, which is in this case key 112, which is before 120, getting us closer to that destination. And so that's the next place that we would want to forward um, uh, our request to effectively. Now, it's possible that the pointer, this layer two pointer here in this case, points to a key that doesn't have a server associated with it. And so in that case, we're gonna forward it to the server that's uh, the next one in this, in this key range. Okay, so I'll go through an example of that. Hopefully we'll make that a little bit more clear. So we have a binary lookup tree rooted every node, uh, threaded through all of these other so-called finger tables. So that's the term that the authors used um, to make, to, to, to refer to this log stack of, of pointers. And what's kind of nice about this from the point of view of a peer-to-peer -peer network as a distributed protocol is that, again, there's not like a single entry point to this network. As long as you have access to any one of the nodes in the network, you can do a lookup. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, yeah, there's no single point of failure, as we'll see. Okay. So this is kind of some pseudocode showing a little bit about what's going on in this case. I posted on Canvas uh, a cord.pdf um, file that actually is like two pages or three pages out of a, a different text that kind of just explains how to do this algorithm. The key thing here is basically that you've got this stack of um, logarithmic number of pointers, and your goal is basically to find, you know, how far you can go where you don't overshoot the 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 target. Okay, let's look at that in practice because this has been pretty abstract. Let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. So imagine that we have a chord ring uh, with a five-bit identifier space. So that's 32 nodes around this ring. So we're going to picture it like this, 0 to 31. OK. Now imagine that we've got, what in this case, three, six. We have nine servers that are going to make up our peer-to-peer -peer network. We take the IP address or the host name or whatever of each of those servers. We run it through our hash function. And it turns out that we get these values. 1, 4, 6, 9, 12, et cetera. I'm going to shade these values on the screen, indicating that that's where the nodes are. OK. Now, in order to actually do this lookup, uh, we are going to want to fill in these so-called finger tables, these lookup tables that give us this logarithmic performance. Um, and so I'm showing you kind of a picture like this, and this is very similar to what the worksheet is for Friday, the, the, the homework assignment for Friday, and it kind of gives you a sense for how you're going to start filling these things in. Okay, now if I'm able to, I guess I can't type, let me see. Um, let's uh, okay. Um, so let me show you just how to fill these in first, and then I'll show you a kind of more detailed example on the, on the next slide. Okay, so let's say that we're at node four. So we're over here at node four, and um, we have five entries in our finger table. Reason we have five is that we have 32 nodes in our system. Log of 32 is five. Okay. At each of these entry points right here, we're basically going to pick a key that is a power of two away. So the way to think about this first one is sort of oops, two to the zero equals one uh, is going to be our um, a little bit smaller. OK. Can you all see the text annotation that I just added to there? OK, cool. So oops. Uh, OK, great. So what is one key away from four? So the way to think about it is we are node four. That's our node. So if we were to go one hop away, that is basically four plus two to the zero equals four plus one equals five. The next entry would be four plus two to the first equals four plus two equals six. 
4 plus 2 squared equals uh, 4 plus 4 equals 8. Uh, 4 plus 2 to the third uh, equals 4 plus 8 equals 12. And then finally, 4 plus 2 to the fourth uh, equals 4 plus 16 equals 20. Okay. So what you would do is for each of these entries, you're basically adding a power of two to that. Okay, so here's the kind of interesting question. What node is responsible for key five? Six, perfect, great, absolutely. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, oops. Okay, let me bring this over here. Okay, so I'm gonna put six right in this box. Um, meaning that it is uh, uh, the node that's, that we're gonna forward to basically. It's like a routing table in some sense. Okay, what's the node responsible for six? That's also six. The node responsible for eight, if we just look here, would be nine. The node responsible for 12 is in this case 12. Let me make that a little bit bigger. And then finally, uh, the node that's responsible for 20 would be 21. So if I was at node four and I wanted to look up say key 17, okay, so I'm at node four and I wanna look up 17, what would we do? Does anyone have a sense for how we would address this problem? I'll just write this so you can see it. Four is gonna look up 17. Great, ask 12, absolutely. I'm sorry, ask, uh, okay, so, um, interesting, couple potential uh, options in, in the chat window. So if we were to go to node 21 right here, uh, we would have, um, I'm sorry, so we're looking up 17. And so our goal basically is to f look um, in this key space and say, well, 17 is sort of between four and five. Uh, so, I mean, I'm sorry, between 12 and, and 21. Um, so what we would do is, uh, we would go to, to node 12. Um, so you're right that it's actually stored on node 21, but uh, if we sort of look at this, um, if we look at this key space here on the right, so this these parts that are bolded right here, let me make those bold. So these are the, key, the, the keys we're gonna kind of do our binary search in. There we go. So 17 fits right between 12 and 20. Uh, so we're going to go here to uh, to 12. So if we look this up right here, it's basically the highest n where um, it fits between the, the key and, and the one right before it. We're going to send it right there to n. So we'd send it here to 12. And now 12 would finish the job for us. Okay, so just like before, we now have uh, this same process happening here at node 12. Let me just copy this over. except instead of starting with four, it's now starting with 12. So we have to build the finger table for node 12. And in this case, it would look like this. Thirteen, 14, uh, 16, 20, and uh, 28. Okay, so now we're looking for node 17. Um, okay, so the, we're looking for node 17. That's right here between 16 and 20. Uh, so we're going to send it to um, the node responsible for 16, which is 21, and 21 would have our data. Okay, question about our finger, finger tables cache, or do we do this on each lookup? That's a great question. Um, at the moment, we're just looking at the kind of logic of how this lookup occurs. In reality, each node is simply going to build its own local finger table. And as requests get forwarded around, um, you'll only consult your local information. So um, basically, the way to think about this is that just like a DNS lookup goes from sort of one DNS server to the next, uh, this lookup's the same way. We're going to be passing a request from one node to the next, and that will get it kind of closer to where it's going. OK. I'm gonna show now a slide that has a lot going on. So just sort of take this in for a second. Um, there's a lot going on here and it kind of makes sense to take a look at it on your own time potentially. 
what is happening here is it's demonstrating two different lookups. So there's one lookup, which is this solid line right here. And then there's this sort of dash lookup, which is like another, another problem right here. It shows in this particular case, each of the finger tables um, uh, that have been fully completed. So from before, I kind of showed you how we compute the, the finger table. So you start with basically the node number, oops, and you add these powers of two, that gives you a key number, and you look up that key, figure out what the successor is, and you kind of fill in the table with what the successors are. This just kind of short circuits that for us. And what we'd like to do is trace a lookup of key 26 from node one. So given, let me see if I can turn my ink on here. Yeah, okay, so we're up here at node one, um, and we're trying to look up key 26. So basically, um, if we, we want to find a position where we can sort of separate, you know, that's, that the key we're looking up is, is sort of greater than the one before it and smaller than the one after it. Because 26 is bigger than 18, we're just going to go as far as we possibly can all the way around the ring down here to node 18. So that's like we've cut basically half of the key space away. This is where that log lookup time is coming from. Now we're going to continue looking up key 26. And so we basically start here at node five, and we want to figure out sort of where in this list we need to look up next. So 26 is right between 20 and 28, meaning that we now need to forward to node 20. Now you may notice that, and this has happened in, sometimes in the past, some people say, well, wait a minute, isn't 26 between four and 28? Well, again, this is all sort of modular arithmetic. So um, uh, you can think of four here as sort of being like 36. It would have been 36, but because we wrap around, it becomes, it becomes four. So 26 right between 20 and 28. So now we're here. We look up 26 again, and it's right between 21 and 28. So we sort of go to the one right before it, which is 21 right here. And in this particular case, the answer is going to be stored on node 28. So we know that the answer in this case is stored on node 28 because this node 21 does not have the data representing key 26. And it doesn't have that because it only has the information between it and the node before it. And so it's just gonna follow this next pointer right here, get to node 28, that has the data we're looking for. Okay, does that sort of walk through kind of make sense to folks? Okay. Let's look at the next example. So now we're gonna look up um, uh, key 12 from node 28. So here we are over here at node 28, and we're looking up key 12. Okay, same kind of deal. We look here at this table, um, and if we were to go to node 14, that would be too far. We would have, we would have um, gone all the way around past 12, which is what we're looking for, and hit 14. So we're gonna go here to node four. So that's where we're gonna go. So we zoom over here to four. Again, same thing here. We're looking up key, what, 12, right there. So we go to the one right before it, nine. So now we're here and 12 fits in right, right here. So that gets us to node 11. Again, follow the next pointer. And this is the ultimate destination where the data is located. Okay, as I mentioned before, um, this mechanism of um, consistent hashing with this ring data structure is what underpins uh, this DynamoDB database, uh, which is a so-called, um, sometimes you might have heard this concept of uh, NoSQL database or something like that. Um, if you've taken a database class, that, that's what this is and that's how that works. Um, interesting, they, I guess, handle more than 10 trillion requests per day, which seems kind of like a lot. So, the point is just that the reason that they're handling in this particular case, oops, 20, mi ah, um, 20 million requests per second and 10 trillion requests a day is this um, load distribution aspect that it has where you can simply add servers to your cluster and the requests will automatically find the right location and you can just sort of add and remove servers in order to scale out that load. Okay, a couple other things. Um, 
in some sense, this question is sort of, you know, we've defined uh, logarithmic as fast or as efficient. Um, is it, it kind of depends if we're talking about the wide area internet. So the original idea behind this cord was that all kind of people would run it all the time. Uh, and you might have millions of nodes. Um, kind of depends what you mean by lookup. I mean, fast. So a million nodes, that's about 20 hops or so. And if on the internet, each RPC call takes 50 milliseconds, let's just call it. You know, that means that every time you do a, a lookup, you're talking about roughly speaking a second or something like that. In terms of looking up, you know, music or something, if you're pirating music, that's probably fine. If we're in that Amazon DynamoDB example, that's probably not going to be fine to wait a second because typically results have to come back in just a couple of milliseconds to meet these kind of service level agreements for whatever that service is going to be. Okay. Now, if we have, say, a thousand servers, suddenly you're down to approximately 10 hops. Um, uh, and in a data center environment, we don't have 50 millisecond uh, RPC calls. We might have 50 microsecond RPC calls. So now we're down into that millisecond regime. Okay. Um, okay, great. So one quick thing I want to talk about. So a few minutes ago, someone asked the question of like, do we build this, um, do we cache the results of the finger table or not or whatever? And I just want to talk about how these data structures get updated. So the first thing we have to talk a little bit about is how we do an insert of our, of our system. So imagine for a second, we're in a data center type environment. We have maybe 20 servers that are going to host the content that we care about. And we notice that the performance is not as high as we'd like. So we want to add at least one more server to our cluster. So how does that work? It's very similar conceptually to link list insert in a data structures class. It's just that we're going to be doing it over the network now. So in this particular picture, we have a, a part of the ring that we're going to demonstrate right here. And we've got two nodes in a row. We've got node 25 and node 40. We are going to look up our own identifier. So we're going to basically hash our own IP address or whatever. And that gives us an identifier of 36. So we now know that we need to insert ourselves into this ring at position 36. So node 25 is going to be the node before us, 40 is the node after us. And right now, node 40 is responsible for these two keys, key 30 and key 38. So that's kind of the setup of where we're at. As we join, what we're going to do is basically we, this is us. We do a lookup, we find the successor of key 36, which is node 40. And, uh, and so we are gonna set our next pointer to 40. Great. Node 25 and node 40 do not yet know we exist. We just now add ourselves to 40. We're gonna begin transferring state um, that represents keys 26 to 36 from node 40. So remember, at this point, when before we joined, node 40 was responsible for everything between 26 and itself, 26 and 40. We basically tell it, hey, we're taking over the key space between 25, I mean, 26 and 36. This causes node 40 to move key 30 to us. Great. Um, there are various, um, um, kind of network edge maintenance instructions that we can send around. And one of them basically notifies uh, nodes that we, that we want to start changing their successor and their predecessor pointers. So at this point, we can assume that we have, that it's a doubly linked list. And so, uh, you know, node 25 has a successor node 40, node 40 has its predecessor node 25. So we're going to tell node 40 to set its predecessor pointer to us. Um, and then basically, um, we can then cause node 25 uh, to, you know, so basically once we tell 40 that we're its predecessor, node 25 and node 40 have been communicating between each other because 25 is going to be handing off to 40 a bunch of requests as it needs to. So basically, 40 will tell 25, hey, uh, my predecessor is now 36, so you should set your successor to 36. And so now no 25 will be pointing to 36. 36 is pointing to 40. 40 has as its predecessor 36. And then we can then set our predecessor back to 25. And now we've added this node right into the network. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the idea uh, in terms of adding new nodes to the system. Any questions about the add process?
Okay, now not on the slides, but I just want to kind of talk about this for a second, which is, um, uh, yes, okay, perfect, great. The question that just came on the chat was what I wanted to describe right now. By adding nodes to the system, you may be saying, well, wait a minute, what happened to these finger tables, right? So we had these finger tables that we calculated statically. We calculated them manually. And the way we calculated them was just by um, like observing this network. As we start adding nodes into the system, this may change those values. So for example, take node 21 right here. So here's node 21. It's got a finger table that looks like this. Let's imagine that node 24 shows up. So now instead of being a dotted outline, it's now a solid circle. Well, what's that going to do to the finger table? Well, um, the thing is, is that the first entry now, key 22, is going to belong to key. So this is 24. So that means that the first one needs to now change to 24. I don't know why the thing's doing that. Two hops away is this node 23. That also needs to point to 24. And then everything else after that is fine. Okay, so it's clear that when we add and then remove nodes, some of these finger tables are going to get um, uh, out of date. So what is going to happen is that each of the nodes in our system is, is going to run a periodic finger table kind of update process. Now, the first element, level one of this table, is we're going to assume always correct, okay? So because of this join process, we're going to just assume as kind of an inductive proof for a second that the first level is always correct. Now the question though is that these other levels might be incorrect. And so what you're gonna basically do is, is sort of rely on what is effectively an induction-based reasoning about this. So periodically, each node, so this is node 21. So node 21 is basically gonna take it's identifier plus one, plus two, plus four, plus eight, plus 16. And it's gonna do a lookup in the system for those numbers. And, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so the question here on the chat was, um, was level one wrong in the example I just gave? It was only in the sense that I didn't quite fill in that scenario all the way. So imagine node 24 does in fact get added to our system. As part of being added, the node 28's predecessor pointer, which is not shown here, would get updated to point to 24. And 21's successor pointer would now point to 24 instead of 28. That means that this top row, this level one row, would get updated to 24. So that would be part of node 24 just joining the system. But now we have this problem where these other nodes, so two, three, four, and five, those could potentially get out of date. Those are what we call soft state, meaning that um, the correctness of chord are only based on the first elements working. So even if we erased every single non-first row finger table from our system, the system would work. It would just run really slowly because it would be running in linear time. So what's going to happen is basically each node is going to probe periodically and figure out what the right answer is. So for example, I might say, okay, I'm node 21. I'm gonna add, say, 16 to my identifier, uh, which would give us, what, 40. Uh, well, if we take that mod 32, I think that's eight, something like that. Um, so basically, we would do a lookup for key eight, and this would tell us the successor of key eight, and we would store that in our finger table. Now, along the way, these might get out of date, as we pointed out. And if that happens, and if you do a lookup in your finger table, and you end up getting to a node that says, hey, wait a minute, I'm actually further away than I should be, you can always go back one level and try again and continue doing that until you get back to level one. So in this example we just talked about, if you are node 21 and you don't know about 20, I'm sorry, node 21 does in fact know about 24, but node 20 might not. So 24 just joined the network and it's now sitting in between node 28 and 21. But node 20 hasn't figured that out yet. Node 20's level one finger table points to node 21. That's its successor pointer. But it's the case that some of these are now out of date. So for example, level two, that represents key 22. So key 22 used to be stored at node 28, but now it should be stored at node 24. How is it gonna figure that out? Periodically, node 20 is gonna add, in this case, two to its identifier to get 22. It's gonna do a lookup. So it might contact node 28 and say, hey, 
tell me where key 22 is or do you have key 22 and note 28 is like i do not have key 22 anymore and so it's like wow okay i know that this is out of date so i'm going to go back one to 21 and say hey tell me who has key 22 and note 21 could say oh that's number 24 and in that way we can store 24 right here in level two so if there's a particular issue, you can always kind of go back one. Uh, ah, so in this fallback case, do we update our finger table immediately since we were wrong, or do we have to wait for the periodic update? Um, the way that the research paper that this is based on kind of describes this problem is basically there's a section describing the maintenance of these successor and predecessor pointers. Again, that's for correctness. The finger tables are there as an optimization. So the idea is that periodically, every minute or two, we're going to freshen up those finger tables by doing a logarithmic number of lookups. And if we see that anything's wrong, we're gonna kind of do this fallback procedure to update our table. So when that gets triggered, in a sense, from a theoretical point of view, it doesn't really matter, just the fact that we're looking things up. However, um, um, you can imagine that if I try to go to a node and it says the information you have is outdated, we might decide to um, do this fallback procedure and just update our table right exactly at that point. Okay. Ah, great question. What happens if the key doesn't exist? So the way to think about it is that the lookup operation in Cord takes a key and it maps it to the node responsible for that key. So in this example that we've got here on the screen, node 20, key 27 is the responsibility of node 28. So if I do a lookup on 27, it's going to return back the IP address for node 28. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that 28 has key 27. So for example, um, inside of, of node 28, there's just a standard kind of hash table, hash map data structure that has a get and put operation. So once I do the lookup on key 27 and I connect to node 28 and I say, give me key 27, it might return back with like key not bound or something like that. Because if we go way back to our, um, I don't know, oh, that's not disappearing, but whatever. Um, if we go way back here, the key, okay, I won't use the word key, the, the first main RPC call or whatever is basically to assign this to an IP address. Once you've assigned it to the responsible IP address, when you send these two RPC calls right here, these might fail for whatever reason. That's totally, un, you know, that might happen. That's completely expected. Good question. Good question. Okay. That was the two minute warning. Okay. Um, so that's it for Cord. Um, the reason that I'm covering Cord is because I think um, it's useful and important to kind of get a sense of a distributed protocol that is truly distributed and to show that um, uh, you can rely on some kind of interesting algorithmics related to consistent hashing related to modular arithmetic to be able to very quickly find data in this large scalable system. And to also point out that um, this consistent hashing approach actually underpins data center applications as well. Um, in terms of something like the final exam, what I would ask you to do is to be able to take a worksheet that looks like this and given a set of nodes that are shaded, given a starting point and a key, you would wanna be able to tell me what that lookup looks like. For example, if I'm at node 12 and I look up key 27, you would say something like, okay, I go from 12 to 21 to 27, or I mean 28 or whatever it is. Um, so you would want to give me the kind of set of hops required to look up a particular key from a particular source. Now, one of the things I would say in that example, if you have a worksheet like this or a problem like this, um, you only really need to fill in and calculate the finger tables for the nodes you happen to go through. So if you skip over a shaded node, you don't necessarily want to spend time calculating its finger table because you don't actually use that information. Okay. Any questions uh, at this point about court? Yes, you can have practice on this. It's homework four. So the, the homework that's posted this due Friday is exactly practice on this. So take a look at that. Okay, in the last example, if we're looking for node 22 and node 24 doesn't exist, we would map to node 28. That's correct. So if 24 was not on here, so if this was like a dotted hollow circle, then key 22 would be stored on node 28. That's correct. 
that's right. Uh, once 24 exists, we would still map to 28. So once 24 exists, key 22 will live on 24, okay? Now the question is, there's a small period of time when these other finger tables have not yet been updated yet. During that small period of time, we might try to do a lookup on node 28, but node 28 is going to tell us I'm not responsible for node 22. So that means we know our finger table's out of date. So we're basically going to go one level up and try again. And we're going to keep doing that until we get to our next pointer. We know that if we follow the next pointer, it will work correctly. Uh, so we just basically keep kind of um, evicting from our little cache here those out of date entries until we get the right answer and then we put that right back in. Okay, uh, that's it for time. Thanks for being patient with this Zoom thing. If you have other questions, please use the Discord and uh, we will have another Zoom class on Friday um, looking a little bit at energy and data centers and then probably have some open Q&A and things like that for the, for the final. All right, good luck everyone. Don't forget about project uh, three. Okay, take care.